keep catering to all of us equally. And I look forward to Antonio's talk. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, everyone. I'm not sure it's going to appeal. It's, it's going to be fun for everyone, but I will try. So please stop me whenever you don't understand something or if you already have heard this one before. So this is a recent work I did with um, my student Lorenzo and other collaborators, Alexander Sladek, Stefan Mangel, uh, Martin Trapp, Arno Solin, and Nicola Gillis. So, um, and I'm Antonio. And I have a lab in Edinburgh called April. And April for today is going to stand for essentially about probability reasoning integrals and logic, trying to appease both communities. So what I would like to talk about is introducing this concept of notations and negations in probability uh, land. And therefore, this translates into subtracting probability masses or densities in mixture models. I will show you how we can take these models with these negative values, with these subtractions, and translate them into deep circuits that we're going to square. Why we're going to do this, it's going to be revealed later on. Then I will use this model class to connect it to other model classes that apparently are very different in terms of syntax and in terms of like uses. They are um, emerging from other fields like kernel optimization and quantum physics. And I would like to review which kind of inference routines are tractably supported by this model class, this deep subtractive mixture models. I will then argue that they might be more expressive and try to talk a little bit about the theory behind this and very briefly touch some open problems related to this field um, and these model classes that are quite new, at least to me. Okay, so this, this is my promise. So if you don't sleep or don't sleep too much, or you don't think too much about lunch, I hope that you're gonna um, find a couple of these things interesting. So I'm gonna talk about a circuit lower bound some of you in the um, theoretical community might find this interesting, I hope, or tell me, for example, this is known, or this might connect to these other interesting things. And then I hope to expose the theoretical computer science community to connections with the probabilistic ones. PGMs, and we already have been done this through this great um, seminar these days, learning and mixture models, of course. For the machine learning people, I will introduce this new tractable model class to play with. In includes ingredients you already know about, but hopefully can open up new learning and representation perspectives. And I will also show a simplified way to represent, at least on paper or on slides, circuits and deep circuits. And this, I found it's a very simple way to explain algorithms. It happens on that, okay? So this is the plan for the rest of the talk. Okay. Let's start with the subtractive mixture models. So how many of you actually know what a mixture model is? Because this talk can go really wrong if I'm, I don't make sure that we are on the same page. OK. Many hands raised. So I do believe that the theoretical computer science people left for lunch. That's OK. <laughs> <laughs> so. So mixtures are so beautiful and so fine, and they appear basically everywhere in machine learning. And still nowadays are used everywhere, from computer vision, even to language, speech, and so on and so forth. But why is that the reason? Because they allow you to model complex distribution by utilizing simpler distributions. For example, in this picture, you just pick three simple Gaussians, then you put them together, and then you have a distribution that is more expressive than the single um, Gaussian components. How do we do this? Well, the canonical way to represent a mixture model, or at least what we find usually on textbooks, right, on the bishop, for example, is this one. So my mixture model is defined as a convex combination of k components. There are some other functions. In this case, they can be probability masses or probability densities defined over some possibly high dimensional space. When I said convex combination, I mean that we do have some constraints over these parameters here. 
So one constraint is that these parameters need to be non-negative, and they need to sum to one. Now, the second part is really not that crucial because you can renormalize them all. But the first one truly is. Why is that the case? Because if we really want to have this very cheap rule to distill a complex distribution from simpler distribution, then as long as these guys are valid probability masses or valid probability densities, and these guys are positive, then also this guy is going to be an unnormalized density or mass. Okay, So that's the super simple ingredient of mixture models. Keep this guy um, in mind. I like to call this model additive mixture models, just to make a distinction with the subtractive version I'm going to introduce in a bit. So in Robert's talk, you already saw how to translate them into the language of probabilistic circuits, or PCs. Right? Let me just reiterate a little bit more, because this is yet another slightly variation of the circuit languages that you have been exposed to through this seminar, right? Just to see that we are on the same page. So to translate the example for the Gaussian mixture model that we saw before, we have three components, C1, C2, C3. I'm going to represent them as circles, as input units. And these input units are going to essentially encode probability densities, OK? You can remove Gaussians, and you can put whatever you want, even a small neural network. Right, so that's the first part. Then we're going to connect that to a sum unit, and this is going to be a weighted sum unit. So these are our weights, and we are assuming these weights to be um, non-negative. Okay, so we read it this in the feed-forward way. So we feed some observation values for the three Gaussian components. We read out their PDFs. We mix these real numbers with the weights, and then we read out essentially the PDF for the for the uh, Gaussian mixture component for that point. If I have to loop this into the circuit language, what are the properties of this circuit here specifically? So this is a sum unit, and this sum unit is smooth because all the inputs essentially are defined over the same set of variables. Then the re there are no product units here. So it's a very trivial case of a decomposable circuit, and even structure decomposable, right? So for now, forget about products. They're going to come into play when we are moving to deeper circuits. But these are the kind of gadgets I'm interested in right now. OK, so please ask questions if this language is not clear at this point. So small, shallow, additive mixture models define the circuit. Another way to call this kind of circuit is to monotonic. And this comes from the fact that these weights are the negative. <clears throat> now. Mixtures, as I was saying, allow us to model these complex distributions and also allow to keep inference tractable as long as your input distributions allow for tractable computations. For example, if they do allow you to do tractable marginalization or conditionals, then therefore the whole mixture allows you to compute tractable marginals and tractable conditionals, right? And in the machine learning land, we also love mixtures because we say they are universal approximators. What does it mean? Well, it means that if you have lots of them, if we, in the limit, if we put the number k, the number of the components to the limit, then we should be able to approximate arbitrary well any possible distribution, OK? So let me give you some example. And this goes a little bit also in the direction of a possible answer to the question Scott had in the previous talk. So, a good is a mixture model to model complex distributions, right? I'm not going to claim these are real-world models, real-world distributions, like the banana distribution or the funnel one, but they are definitely not Gaussian, OK? So let's play the game. How many Gaussian components do we need to fit these distributions well, OK? Let me start with two. Not a great job. We need to increase the number of components, right? So I'm going to switch to 10. Something better, the banana is, is OK, right? It's almost ripe. But we need many, many more if we want to have like um, somehow more reasonable feeding. Well, this is, I would say, expected in the sense that the universal approximation holds in the limit, right? So the whole point here is, can we do better? 
And in a sense, circuits already ask this question, because whenever you have a circuit that encodes a deep mixture model, or if you want a hierarchical mixture model, you can encode an exponential number of components. Exponential in what? In the depth of the circuit. Okay. However, even if we go with a circuit that is monotonic, just increasing the small gadget I showed you before, we're only allowed to add components. So adding circles here in the picture. The power of negation that you know, for example, in logic, translates in probability land with the power of subtracting masses. And this can drastically reduce the number of components that you care about. Let's go to an even simpler example. Not many circles, just two circles, right? How many Gaussians do you need to fit this guy here? So if I use two and I fit a Gaussian mixture model, I get this. I go to 16, better job, but feels like useless. Or, well, not really useless, but wasteful. And the fact is that actually, ideally, I would only need two components. A larger one or the larger circle. And I would like to subtract the second one out of it. So from here, I hope this is somehow visible, right? So this is what a subtractive mixture model look like. So you allow the weights of the mixture model to be negative. And in this way, you can subtract mass and you can subtract densities, right? So ideally, this sounds like a good idea and a good idea that can save us lots of components. But how many of, well, spoiler, you can save an exponentially number of components and you can analyze this in the language of circuit. But I'm gonna reveal this only later on. I'm gonna give you the nitty gritty details. So please, if you're interested in this, try to follow everything, or if you want, you can start sleeping, and I can use the bell at the appropriate moment to wake you up just for the, for the circuit lower bound, okay. Well, let me get back to this subtraction mixture model. Let me give a little bit more of nomenclature and context. So in the land of circuits, if I have to represent this as a circuit, I would call this a non-monotonic circuit, which are objects that are very well defined in complexity and in logic. We are just taking this and translating that into this dialect, that's the dialect of probabilistic circuits, where your input can be whatever functions you want, as long as they are tractable for your downstream reasoning task. Now, what's the issue though? If we just arbitrarily introduce negative parameters, even in a shallow mixture model, how do we preserve that the output of our small circuit that encodes a mixture model is not negative? And I want it to be not negative if I want to model a density or a mass. For example, here, if I have two Gaussians, can I always place the two Gaussians everywhere and then just make sure, how do I make sure that their subtraction is in a negative value? For Gaussian, we know how to impose this constraint. So it's essentially we need to place the variance and restrict the variance of the component we are subtracting and place the mean in a certain way such that the circle, for example, always fall inside the bigger circle. And if we play this carefully, then this, we, we, we can do a pretty, pretty good job. For other distribution, this is also known. For example, Weibull's statisticians know this. Um, however, this is quite limited to single components, sorry, single parametric families for the components, and to components that are homogeneous in statistical data type, and also to mixtures that are smooth. So my question for the talk is essentially, can we have a more general principle such that we can allow these negative parameters, we make sure that the output is always non-negative, we allow deep subtractive mixture models. And I will give you an initial um, solution for this by using non-monotonic circuits that are squared. So the squared is gonna be the trick to preserve um, non-negative outputs. Later on, I would argue that this kind of solution also has been known or used in different variations in other fields. And I will connect these other fields. And one of these fields is the one with uh, positive semi-definite kernel um, models. And the other one is tensor networks, for example. Okay. Now, how do I realize a non-monotonic circuit, which for now I want to be like smooth and of course decomposable? Um, well, I just keep a circuit here, right? And now I allow all these parameters 
to be whatever they want. So every possible value on the real line. So what I'm doing here is allowing also this output to be negative. Okay. So this is going to be the starting ingredient of this construction. Then I'm going to take this and square it. So if I squared the output of the circuit and therefore the circuit, the output is always going to be non-negative. Okay. Do I still have negative parameters? Do I get an advantage? Am I able to subtract things or not? Well, to see this, I just need to expand the square. So to expand the square, essentially, I'm going to have not k components, but something in the order of k squared components. So c1, which is now squared, c2 that is squared, c3 that is squared, and the cross products. c1 and c2, c1 and c3, c2 and c3, right? Now, what happens to the weights? These weights are squared, the weights corresponding to the square components. But the other ones are cross interactions. So if they were negative at the beginning, and the both of them are not negative, then this is going to be negative. So in a sense, you have a mixture that allows for negative parameters, subtractions. And therefore, this is the square circuit is a non-monotonic circuit. So just to recap, I take a simple sum, I square it, and now I have essentially a quadratic number of components. If you think about that, I said before that increasing the number of components increases expressiveness. So just doing this trick, since I'm keeping the number of parameters that I can learn from data the same, is still k, but now I allow for a quadratic number of components, I already have a small boost in expressivity. OK? OK. So this is going to be the plan. I would like to square um, mixture models encoded as non-monotonic circuits. And actually, the example I showed you before comes from one of these squared Gaussian mixture models. So I just pick a Gaussian mixture model. I let the parameters to be negative, and then I square it. But here, you seem to see only two components. Where's the third component, for example, doing the cross interaction? Well, it simply collapsed into one of the two. So the model learned like to just use a, a, a single positive component, forget about the third one, and then subtract essentially the middle one. This is a, a Gaussian mixture model squared starting from two components. Okay, now that you are in this frame of mind, you can think of, well, I actually don't need the inputs to be valid probability masses or densities. Even a negative function will do. And to make Scott happy, we can use polynomials, which are amazing, <laughs> and play very well with this. And why do we want them? Because we still have a small constraint detail here. And the fact is that if I want to renormalize this whole guy, I need to compute the partition function. And what's the partition function of a squared model? Is that this big integral. That is essentially a quadratic number of integrals over these cross products. For people in machine learning, these are essentially products of experts. And what I want to being able to compute this partition function efficiently and exactly, the distractably, is that these product of experts are tractable. We are lucky, such that, for example, polynomials or other parametric functions like Gaussians, exponential families allow us to do this analytically. Okay. Okay, so that was the first part. Subtraction and mixture models, they do exist. And if you square, now we have a sort of learning principle on how to keep the negative parameters and potentially get something more in terms of expressiveness. But I want to go deeper, not just interested in small, shallow mixture models. I want to have like deep circuits, right? And square them all. So how do we do this? Well, we need to introduce products. And as Robert was showing, then we can have like fairly deep circuits, OK? As I was saying before, the depth allows you already to have an exponential number of components, right? When we square a circuit that is deep, then essentially we have a number of components that is exponential in twice the depth, right? But by adding the negative components, we can increase this even more. So here's my problem for the next five slides. 
How do I efficiently square, and therefore I want to renormalize a deep circuit? Any idea? Structure to composability. All right, some, some kind voice from the back <laughs> says like the right answer and the right, the right suggestion. So we need certain properties essentially to make sure that the squared version of the circuit is yet another circuit with smoothness and decomposability. The property we care about, my apologies, for um, efficient renormalization. But many of the people in theoretical computer science would know this algorithm as the apply algorithm essentially. Now we are taken to circuits and apply the product of, of operation among them, right? And to do that, as the um, clever suggestion from the back, <laughs> from the eye said, we need that the input is not only smooth and decomposable, it's smooth and structured decomposable, okay? So if we do this, then the output is gonna be smooth and structured decomposable. And therefore, this is sufficient for tractable renormalizing the circuit. Now we also know from the different application of apply that if you want to compute the partition function, then we can do this linear in the size of the square circuit. And the size of the square circuit is roughly, or better, loosely upper bounded by the square of the size of the initial circuit. I'm stressing this out because there is a nice insight coming later on uh, from the tensorization point of view. So, when I was writing the algorithm in a previous paper, when we were trying to have like small atomic operations to do all kinds of um, operations over circuits, this was my multiply uh, list. I could have like simplified it a bit and actually doesn't cover many corner cases. I had a student who pointed out at least two corner cases that are not covered in this, right? So I put this here just to make the point that if you don't want to implement that yourself or even write that yourself in LaTeX, I'm not gonna provide you here a simplified version for the squared algorithm. Where simplified means you're not gonna lose anything or you're not gonna gain anything in terms of life of complexity, but you're gonna have like a better way to understand the algorithm and a better way to implement it if you really care to put the circuit on the GPU, for example, okay? So this is how the algorithm is gonna look like. It can still be simplified a lot, but it's basically a bunch of linear algebra operation. So how do we get this? So we need to do a little bit of a leap. If I manage to have you here understanding this language of circuits, now there is a little bit of leap of faith because now I need to tell you what's this slightly different notation here, right? But once you get this different notation, then the squared algorithm really, really comes out very intuitively. So what's this guy here? So this is a way to tensorize the structured decomposable PCs that we need to make the square. We're gonna abstract them into layers. And what do I mean by that? I'm gonna take many of the units that I do have across the graph and group them together according to their scopes. And I'm gonna color these groups, right? Such that later on I exactly understand that they have the same scope and they follow a certain particular way to decompose their, their scopes. And this is essentially the recipe behind um, variable orders, B trees, or region graphs, okay? Now, if you do this, for example, in this case, you just have three units here, three other units here, and then you join them in products, such that you do the product of the first with the first, the third with the third, and so on and so forth. Instead, for the sums, you are allowed at most to connect everything to everything. And if you put a play, um, a weight to every of these connections, then essentially you have a small matrix here. If you keep doing this for all the pieces of the circuit, essentially you just need to keep track of these small layers and their parameterization in matrix formulation. And this is quite useful if you want to just map everything to the GPU and if you want to multiply two different circuits or square a single circuit that is structurally decomposable. So in vector notation, I just I have a vector of a certain length, let's say k, another vector of another length k. I do the Adamard product, which is the element-wise product, and then I do simply a matrix multiplication. 
and that's it. And I'm going to have as output a vector length 3 that essentially collects the PDFs or masses or intermediate results of my circuit. OK? So every layer is a vectorized um, computation. And then we use parametrization by matrices. Now, as I was saying before, this helps you also understand very quickly that if I have a region graph or a V-tree or a pseudo-tree, then every layer and every region corresponds to one piece of this structure here. So let me also describe a little bit what's going on here, because not, this is not the usual V-tree that you observe. This is a V-tree defined over three variables, x1, x2, x3. And this is a partition that tells me that I have to split x2 and x3 on one end and x1 on the other. And then I keep partitioning this guy here. I don't know if you can appreciate that this is orange and this is red and they're slightly different, into x3 and x2. And this is exactly the recipe that I have in the circuit here. So in this circuit here, I have a layer that contains a bunch of functions defined over x2, as the caller, and another bunch of functions over x3, as the caller. Then this product here corresponds to the partition, this product layer. And this sum layer here corresponds to this other region here. OK? And I keep doing this. OK, so this is not a so deep circuit, but it's like fairly deep, deep enough for me not to waste too much time to draw it and fit into, fits into the slide, OK? Now, let's go back to the simple case to give an intuition how to square the deep circuit in this format. I was already coloring things before and grouping them in a sense. And then we said that if I want to square a shallow mixture model that is encoded as a simple circuit, whatever I need to do is essentially squaring this layer and putting a quadratic number of components here and properly connect them by doing the cross products. Okay. This is a simple idea I need to repeat for all possible layers in the circuit. So if I take a, take a deep circuit here, which is structured according to a variable order partitioning region graph, then this is what I'm going to get. It's the same structure because the circuit is going to be structurally composable and, as we say, compatible with the first one. They're going to share the same exact region graph for V3 or pseudo tree. And simply, every layer is going to get squared. And by squaring, I mean introducing a quadratic number of components. I'm drawing them here as squares for simplicity, but they are vectors. And then for the parameterizations, I'm just going to do the, the Kronecker product with the previous ones. And if you ask me, this is a much cleaner, much simplified version to understand the algorithm and to put that on the GPU. And it's very intuitive. And I always had trouble explaining people how to essentially do the product of two circuits. Same machinery works if you have two different circuits, not the same one you want to do the product together. And this is because they are color coded in the same way. That is essentially um, conforming to the same region graph slash v3 slash pseudo tree. Okay. Now, as I said before, we know this loose upper bound, which is squared in the size of the circuit, right? But if we look at that from the perspective of this kind of colored Lego blocks, then I know that the size of the circuit is basically the number of the layers times the size of the layers, right? However, I know that this square just corresponds to squaring these layers here. So I'm not actually squaring the L. I'm simply like keeping the same number of layers and I'm squaring the size of the layers. So this is still a little bit, um, it, it, it's a tighter upper bound. So I'm, I'm much finer with this than with the previous one. Helps me better understand what's going on. Okay. So this is the product of the circuits. For those of you who do not know, for those of you who already knew, just think like a strange kind of apply over circuits that encode functions at the inputs that are not just literals and that you can somehow group and, and run on the GPU. Okay. Okay. So let's go to the other step. Which other inference and model classes they support? 
Well, when we were doing with he the first tutorial on probabilistic circuit, then we really liked to have this graphic for the alphabet soup for all kinds of acronyms in the tractable um, probabilistic modeling community. So I'm super pleased today to introduce more acronyms to this mess. But in a sense, this is going to be a good thing in the sense that we know that we can connect them with the literature we have in the circuit. And very likely, we can bring something that they have in their communities in our community. Right. So the first one is the family of the positive semi-definite kernels. They do represent the negative functions, which you can renormalize. So essentially, a very good recipe to model tractable models, tractable probabilistic models. And they work in these ways. So you pick like a kernel function, and you have, um, let's say, d by d positive semi-definite matrix A. By the property of positive semi-definiteness, you know that the function is always going to be non-negative, no matter which values you get here and you get here out of, the, of your kernels. Okay. Now, if you look at this, it might not be super clear why this construction is related to these squared circuits, squared non-monotonic circuits that I tried to sell you up to now. And the reason it actually is related is it's quite simple. You just do an SVD of the matrix, and therefore you have like a possibly low rank decomposition, and then you retrieve the squares into a mixture. So from this reduction, essentially in cubic time, you go from a PSD model to a squared, a bunch of squared non-monotonic circuits. This community is very rich. They also have guarantees, for example, on how to learn in uh, terms of expressiveness and, and in, in the rate of convergence number of samples to learn these models. So it's quite a gold mine, and we should look into their literature a little bit more. The second one, it's an even larger community, which you might think it's even larger, perhaps, than the circuit community, and spawns from quantum mechanics, physics, and so on and so forth. In this community, you have even different names for the same thing. So you can call the matrix product state or a tensor train a center factorization of a large d-dimensional tensor, which goes by doing several tensor contractions of your sequence of tensors. This is why it's called the tensor train. Well, since we're doing just contractions and sum and products, it's much easier to see that there is a circuit here. It's not immediate, though. You need to do it a little bit more and massage these tensors and to retrieve basically a computational graph that is um, a circuit that is structured decomposable. Then people started to squaring them for different reasons and for much better than um, ju just wanted to fit uh, more complex models, but this actually comes from the Born rule in quantum mechanics. And they call these squared objects Born machines. And then these guys here are basically another family of structured decomposable, non-monotonic um, circuit, squared circuits. Okay. And if you look at them, their region graph is a tree, again, makes sense because they're structured decomposable, but this is what is called a linear tree. So a linear V tree, if you want. Doesn't really matter if it's right linear or uh, left linear, but it's just a linear one. And this is how you can represent them in circuit after you massage a little bit those tensors. It's possible. Okay. So we get this square non-monotonic circuits. We get these positive semi-definite kernels. We get the tensor networks. What can we do with them? So if I just have a circuit that is structured decomposable and smooth and monotonic, for example, I can compute marginal conditionals just by um, in a single feedforward pass of the circuit, as Robert showed in his slide before. For the non-monotonic case, I can still do the same, but in the size of the squared circuit. For sampling, we can sample exactly from a smooth and decomposable circuit that is monotonic, thanks to also the seminal work of Robert on latent variable interpretation. So it's pretty clear what's the semantic of all these sum layers stacked one on top of the other, right? Now, we do not have um, non-negative parameters anymore. Our parameters are negative. 
do we really know how to interpret these some units with negative parameters and latent variables? The answer is no, not yet. However, we know how to sample out of this in a simple autoregressive way by inverse transform sampling. So since we can compute marginals and conditionals, we first um, compute the, mar the marginal CDF for a single variable, and we sample from that. Then conditional value that we sample, we sample for another one, and we keep doing that. So ideally, we will need to evaluate this for the size of the square circuit for the number of variables we care about. If we play clever and we have a balanced circuit, then we can reduce this to a logarithmic time. Can we do map? Well, in monotonic circuits that are smooth and decomposable, we cannot do that unless we add determinism, right? However, if we don't add determinism, we have heuristics from um, the some product network communities, for example, or more beautiful algorithms like Yujang's yesterday that you can still use for that. Can you still use these techniques for non-monotonic square circuits? Yes. You just need to be more careful because you are not propagating just maxes, but since you have also negative parameters, you need to keep track of both maxes, maxes and, and, um, and, and means and minimums altogether. But it's possible. So you can use these approximate techniques. However, if this circuit were deterministic, you could do this. Now the question is, does it really matter if this is deterministic? Do we gain anything if this guy is deterministic? So let me switch to another topic, expressivity. Let's keep this question in mind. What happens if my circuit, my original circuit C, before squaring, is smooth, structure decomposable, and deterministic? And alternatively, if you want, do you gain anything by squaring your probabilistic version of OBDDs, SDDs, and structure decomposable and deterministic? The um, decomposable uh, negation normal forms. Any ideas? No. Well, let's do the same operation as before. Let's just do the math. So we start from this, from the previous guy, and I want to compute the cross interactions, right? However, if this sum unit is deterministic, by definition, if you remember Alexi definition, Essentially, all these inputs have disjoint supports, which means that whenever I compute the cross products, they're going to just cancel out. It's always going to be zero. So you're never going to have negative weights in the first place. And all the weights you have, even if they were negative at the beginning, are going to be squared. So you don't even get the quadratic advantage of squaring the deterministic circuit. No increase in size of the circuit. Therefore, no expressiveness and no negative weights. Okay. However, for what we are interested in, and for all the circuits I showed you so far, there was no determinism. So we are getting something out of that. And here's the lower bound. Where's the battle? Okay, as if I, because there is just the machine learning people here. <laughs> Anyways. Okay, here it goes. There is a class of functions, of course, in the negative such that if I want to represent them with the squared and non-monotonic circuit, this is very tiny, it's very compact. It's actually a shallow mixture model. However, the smallest monotonic and structure decomposable circuit is gonna blow up in size, okay? How do I prove this? Literally by using Alexi's techniques. So we started from his paper with Stefan and we made a rank argument. So here's the rank argument. We pick the function. So at a certain point, I found this function, and I was looking at the function, and then I said, this function is a squared circuit, and it's a squared non-monotonic circuit. And this function goes under the name of the problem of union of disjointness. And then it feels like the perfect <laughs> function for for uh, proving the, um, the lower bound. It comes from the um, matrix factorization community, actually. If you get a function and you know the problem, you know how to compute the rank of the function and let it blow. And how do you do this? Because you construct the value matrix in the very same way that Alexi was showing um, 
two days ago, I think. Okay. And the same construction applies. So you can lower bound the size of the circuit by the size of the summation after you rewrite that as a product of these decomposable functions. And then you have the lower bound for the K that is essentially the rank of this matrix. It's quite simple. And I did not know about that. Let me know if you know connections from your other lower bound backgrounds. Okay, but let's also ask the problem in a more practical way. It is cool that there is this function and tells us that there is an exponential separation between the classes of models, right? And non-monotonicity brings us something to the table. When it comes to learning, we actually get something. I really don't think that my data has been generated by a function that somehow is related to the union of these jumpness problems. Okay, so let's see what happens. So I'm gonna give you first some intuition with 2D data that helps you understand what's going on. First of all, synthetic data sets, the one I showed you before, perhaps slightly more interesting. So here's the data. Here's what you can get if you have a monotonic circuit. Here's what you get if you square a monotonic circuit. And I want to do this check because I want to disentangle the two factors. The increased expressiveness I get just by squaring and the increased expressiveness I get just by introducing negative parameters. And in fact, I'm also compared with the non-monotonic square circuit, okay? So for this very simple 2D densities, you see that just square, squaring gets you something more because you have more components. But you need negative parameters, for example, to get rid of some strange artifacts and get something that is slightly better. I'm not sure if the you can appreciate this uh, through the projector, but some other examples. Non-monotonic, better than non-monotonic square, better than monotonic square, better than monotonic. Okay. Does this always apply? No. Why is that the case in practice? Well, whatever I showed you so far assumes continuous variables. But what happens when we go to the discrete? Imagine that our variables are categorical distributions. For a categorical distribution, even a mixture model that is monotonic or just additive just results in a categorical again. You don't gain anything. Even subtracting, you don't gain much. However, if you're this, because the categorical is very powerful, you have degrees of freedom to capture anything that is discrete with finite states. However, if your base distribution is more limited, like the binomial, then having negative parameters helps more. Does it make some sense? Okay. We find another interesting case where in the discrete, this helps greatly more. And this is where your variables, even if categorical, have many more states, thousands of. And in that case, subtracting might help at least from the point of view of learning. Let me jump to this case, and let me address this plot here. So this plot here shows two curves. One is for the squared non-monotonic, the other is just for the monotonic. And I'm letting vary the number of components that you can have in every layer. So the larger, the more expressive the circuit, just by its size. And the data here I'm trying to fit is data that I uh, sampled from a large language model, GPT-2, following, for example, the, the experiments by Honghua and he. And in this scenario, your laden variables have lots of states because you, every variable encodes a token in a sequence. Possible, lots of tokens in, in, uh, in a position in a sequence, right? So in this case, there is a gain. On the other side, please, to fairly compare, wouldn't you have to move the blue line like square roots to the left? As in like the inference cost being the same? Can you say that again? So here, for the same k, the inference cost is different for the models, right? So if you would verbalize by inference cost at the horizontal axis, you would have to move the blue line a bit closer. So the question is, what am I comparing here? Am I comparing in terms of like cost or in terms of like expressiveness that is like learnable parameters, like degrees that you can fit? This is for degrees that you can fit. In terms of for the uh, inference times, if that is what you mean, like the size of the materialized circuit, um, you don't need to do that for this plot. You need to compare the times, essentially. Or if you want to think of something that Rina would have said, if you have a budget 
in your memory and what's the largest circuit you can fit in the budget, I would still argue that something I didn't have time to explain here, that you actually don't need to materialize the square circuit. You only need to do that when renormalizing. You can do that only once, once the circuit is learned, or only once for every batch. Does it make some sense? Okay. You can just square the output. And... Okay. And here you have a bunch of other like data sets used in the deep learning community for continuous data. And I'm comparing different input distributions, Gaussians or polynomials, splines. And if you are in the up quadrant, squared circuits, squared non-monotonic are better than monotonic. Still holds for squared non-monotonic better than squared monotonic. We're looking at like, like, like likelihood? Yes, likelihoods or log likelihoods. Log likelihoods and, and log likelihoods in both cases. OK. How much time do I have left? Minus five minutes. Sorry. <laughs> Be very quick. <laughs> I should have asked this question before. <laughs> Did on purpose, then smart. <laughs> OK. So open questions. Well, it's an open question, for example, how to retrieve this latent variable semantics in this new class of circuit. Why do we want that? To have faster sampling, but also to have like better ways to train, for example, by expectation maximization. I have some ideas, but I'm super open to discuss this with you if you're interested. Then, of course, how do we learn the structure? And this also be belongs to the fact um, that a latent variable interpretation helps you also learn the structure. And I'm thinking about different ways of learning the structure in a more mechanical, hybrid, mechanical slash data-driven way. Then there are also many other classes of circuits that we need to connect and understand better if they're really more expressive. And to understand if there are lower bounds that can work in one direction or another. I think it's still open in this sense. Lastly, I would think that we really need to connect with the community of quantum mechanics and physics. They are huge and they might benefit a lot from what we're doing especially the work on neurosymbolic AI that Robert showed before. Treating other circuits as the logical circuit, imposing logical hard constraints. I have the feeling, that's my personal perspective from the other community, that they might not be looking into that. However, there are lots of constraints into the physics domain. And constraints perhaps not on just discrete variables, but on mixed, continuous, and discrete. So for the people here interested in. OK, so to recap, I hope I capture a little bit of your attention, dear watcher on YouTube, by, <laughs> by introducing a circuit lower bound to play with, but also a new class of tractable modes to play with, showing that perhaps even just coloring the way we tensorize circuits, and which is the way we implement them ultimately to run them on GPU, helps us also understand how to derive symbolic algorithms that are simpler, at least conceptually, and drawing connections across these whole communities. That's it. So let me just add one more thing. So all of this also falls into the piece of trying to build an automated way to have locks such that we can operate over intermediate, opera intermediate representations of our circuits and automatically process complex mathematical ex expression that are essentially the queries we talked about all these days. And these negative squared circuits can, can play a role in this. Um, there are a bunch of results that um, come from this kind of approach, modular approach to query um, reasoning, but we can discuss about this um, later on. Okay, thank you. We don't actually have any time, but I guess we could have one question. <laughs> Sorry for. Well, maybe just a super quick uh, one uh, about the structural learning. You, you mentioned that it is, is an open problem, but what you what you did in uh, the experiments, you just uh, did in the original circuit. Or? I, I did what we do very commonly these days. For example, um, where did I have? Okay, let's say this. For example, I came up. With a 
region graph or V3 in a mechanized way. And then I populate the circuit by doing this essentially. So for every colored regions, I put some units here and there. So these days we know, for example, that you have options. So you're not limited to the construction of the layers I showed you right now. You can put instead of an Aldermar product, a Kronecker product, instead of a matrix multiplication, some crazier tensor operation. Everything still holds. But if, as long as you keep this template, that's OK. Coming back to the structured learning, I would like to do two things. Learn this from data by using the latent variable interpretation. For example, if I cluster the data, how, which kind of structure do I, do I get from here? This happens in several directions. Very old works like Learn SPN and more recent one like latent variable distillations. So clustering can help you learn the structure also. Also pruning, it's another form of structural learning if you want. So what's the semantic now of pruning these kind of edges? So I have a question or maybe a question for the, so, so this is clearly more powerful and it's really amazing than the monotone structured circuits, but I also feel like uh, there is still a lower bound for this model, right? So I think the determinant doesn't have a multilinear polynomial size circuit. So things like DPPs cannot actually be compactly represented here. So it's a really nice sweet spot between classic PCs and PGCs where you have more tractability, but still somehow kind of the decomposability. Yeah. I think so. I remember reading your paper from Angua that was an open question. If by having negative parameters, you can represent the um, distribution over the spanning trees, for example. Yeah. If you could unlock that, perhaps you have a slightly more, but still like but, you so, have So I'm not one. actually very sure about what I'm saying, but I'm oh, looking okay. at the experts to maybe tell me over lunch if, if <laughs> We need to gather the applies. experts and they are somewhere. <laughs> no, they're, they're here, they're here. Okay, okay thanks. Yeah, 